right, beautiful people. Welcome to the STOA. Uh, so good to see everyone uh, here today. And uh, we are lucky today to have Daniel from Metamodernia uh, returning to the STOA uh, to discuss metamodernism, stage theory, and its critics. Um, and uh, some of you may know, we had a session a couple months ago uh, at the STOA where Dave Stoner came in and criticized pretty much everyone, <laughs> including Daniel and uh, metamodernism. And so Daniel reached out to me and uh, uh, suggested this session so he can respond to um, perhaps some of the criticisms uh, uh, that Snowden uh, um, presented or criticisms more generally of metamodernism. And um, we had, uh, uh, we're going to be here for 90 minutes today. So I'm going to take in uh, Daniel. He has a robust presentation. Um, and feel free to pop questions in the chat anytime. And hopefully we'll get to some uh, before the presentation or the time uh, we have together is up. Um, so that being said, Daniel, uh, welcome back to the store. I'm going to give you co-host access and take you in now. Can you, Thanks. Yes. Yeah. I'm seeing a lot of uh, familiar faces, uh, people I also don't know, but I know your names and uh, and just completely new people. Pleasure to to uh, to have you all here and uh, a bunch of people I'd love to uh, to connect a little bit more mano mano with as well. Um, so I'm gonna share the screen. And, and as um, as Peter said, the the presentation is longer than uh, than I intended, but it's also why I made it a presentation, right? Um, there's just more content to cover than I had. Uh, than uh, just a lot of content to cover, right? So you really uh, you really need to to think it through and uh, just just portion out the points. Uh, so uh, unfortunately, probably this will lead uh, to a little less time uh, for questions than we would like. Um, Hey guys, you can you can ask me later, and uh, yeah, we can have a conversation somehow, or we can do a follow up, Peter, or whatever we want, right? Um, so um, and it's uh, it's recorded, so then then we can we can pass this stuff around if you guys feel it's uh, it's a useful response and that it puts uh, important stuff uh, into perspective, then you can share it around, of course. Let's see. I also want to say, um, one year old is home in a small apartment. If she cries, she cries. She's being grumpy. It is what it is. Um, and if if uh, there's crying that comes through, then just just let me know. We'll try to work something out. Metamodernism and its critics. Also, stage theory debate. Thirty-four slides. Hang on to your seats. So let's start with, I'm gonna, before we get into the meat of the argument, let's start with a couple of contextualizations. Contextualization one, norms of discourse around stuff like metamodernism and stage theory. So I wanna put two or three contextualizations in place so that we know where I'm coming from when I give these arguments or when I answer the arguments. The first, contextualization is about the difference between cancel culture and hygiene of discourse. And um, the, the metaphor I like to use here is that given that a community loosely defined as ours, but, but still with, with a strong focus on, on the key issues of, of a meta crisis, of, uh, of the civilizational, let's say, directionality, and uh, and with connections to so many high impact and important places, and is is a bit like a hospital. It has a, it has the potential to heal important rifts in society, important um, important maladies of society. Let's say sicknesses. We, what we do together is meaningful because it can respond to real issues out there in the world, potentially, right? So the hospital needs hygiene. The, and the hygiene 
the more hygiene you have, the higher standards of hygiene you have in the, nor in the norms of the discourse that we engage one another with, the, the rules of engagement, let's say, the more radical we can be in the content of what we do. So in the 1800s, a hospital could not be doing transplants, heart transplants. Uh, and uh, pe more people died in hospitals than were helped because they didn't know the ground rules of germs, of hygiene, and so forth, right? So when people break norms in these, in these settings, we have to differentiate between cancel culture, which means I'm not going to accept your argument, or I'm not going to accept the content of your thought, I'm not going to accept your position, and the, and the form, which is I'm not going to accept the, the way in which you are playing this game of, of, of communication with me or with us. We're not, we're going to have high levels for that. And the higher levels we keep of, of hygiene, of, um, the, of uh, ethical conduct and communication, the more stable container we have. So uh, norm breaches lead to the lowest common denominator. Eventually, the, the, the attractor point on the far end is violence. High discourse ethics lead to attractor points of the field, mean, meaning we connect around deeper and deeper points, not necessarily points of agreement. They, these can be points of contention. These can be open systems or open wounds, so to speak, that we come back to again and again. And the stage theory debate is one such attractor point, but they become productive. They, they uh, draw us in and, and interconnect us in productive ways. They, they lead to co-development so form and content are not the same. So I think we should have very strong norms on how we behave vis-a-vis -vis one another. So before I go on, I will then look at the norm breaches of the critics of, of metamodernism and stage theory. I'm mentioning three of them here, ad hominems, paper tigers, and red herrings, but I'm also mentioning one that's on the fence of what's acceptable, guilt by association, which is, uh, I mean, you can still respond to those things. So ad hominems, uh, before I continue, I, this was sparked as, as uh, uh, Peter said by, by um, uh, Dave Snowden's uh, um, talk here on, on the STOA. And in that talk, he says, for instance, he, he does a lot of uh, norm breaches, I, I would say, but he, he says, Daniel is continuously mansplaining to Nora Bateson, meaning this other person I talked to about stage theory, um, in order to get uh, in order to get her to say what he wants her to say, quite appalling, actually, I think I'm going to use it as a textbook case. So I'm being accused then of uh, sexism and mansplaining. I'm also being accused of having uh, bad intentions in, uh, when I'm in a discourse with a person um, on, on a debate where we have opposite positions. But my very position is thought of as, um, as a uh, proof of my my uh, um, bad intent, then I suppose, or, or uh, uh, lack of goodwill in the discourse. Now, th these are disprovable claims, and they're also used to brush off my argumentation. So my strong position on this is that I will simply ignore this guy. I will not ignore his arguments, but I'll ignore the guy, and I will not have anything to do with him until there is a public apology. On this matter and I actually suggest for others to do is likewise because if we don't we inadvertently um, we inadvertently reward drama and we reward a foul play that you can't really defend yourself against oh this dude is a, is a sexist or whatever right uh, you can't really when I'm explaining my position am I mansplaining myself etc cetera, etc cetera. but just to check though for for the record, I did call up Nora Bateson. I did tell her that from a vulnerable position that, that I find this sort of stuff unacceptable and hurtful. And I asked her if it comes, if there is any grounding in it. And she, while she said, well, generally speaking, people of your position uh, defending the stage theory is part of, are part of a larger structure that's uh, part of the patriarchal and so forth. She also conceded that she has not said anything 
for the sword and didn't think of it that way. So um, yeah, so, so she was not a defenseless person in that setting. And he concluded that if we talk again, we talk as friends. So that's very nice. Um, yeah, uh, Paper Tigers, Strawman. You have to actually read the books. You have to actually read the books to uh, for for uh, uh, to be able to critique them, and we'll we'll get back to all of that. And red herrings. Um, so uh, uh, looking at stuff that uh, maybe a few uh, not very gifted spiral dynamics people did uh, years ago, and uh, saying, "Oh, this is what stage theory is about." So the fact that a few stage theory people uh, Talked, uh, 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 talked down to somebody and said, oh, you're not high enough stage when I stand this or something like that, does not in and of itself disprove that any stage theories can be useful, right? So these these three are sort of beyond the, the uh, bounds of what I feel should be acceptable in a discourse. And uh, if we want to maintain good hygiene, we should not reward uh, or follow up on as such, uh, as such behaviors. And of course, people are, it's a free country, it's a free world, you can do what you want, but we shouldn't reward them, right? And we should, we should not give them further, uh, uh, further attention, which is usually what, what's the reinforcer here. Well, and then there are, there are norm breaches that are acceptable, but not great. Um, so that, here we have stuff like the guilt by association stuff. So stage theories have hierarchy. So do Nazis. Uh, hence, eugenics, uh, or hence stage theories equate with eugenics or its modern eugenics. Um, so I would say we should together make an effort to not fall into the traps of, uh, of guilt by association. So cybernetics, for instance, uh, which is uh, uh, Nora Bateson's own tradition, um, was um, uh, instituted at these Macy conferences, which were funded, which were funded by the Macy Foundation. Macy found, Foundation was big oil money and uh, whaling money uh, connected to the U.S. military, and they also funded uh, eugenics and race science. Um, that's what that was one of their main purposes when they were first instituted. They don't any longer, of course. I'm not saying then that Nora or anything she does has anything to do with eugenics. I'm saying if we're to use that sort of um, guilt by association arguments, uh, she would be in much worse trouble than, than any of the stage theories. And I'm saying we should not push towards that lowest common denominator. We should look at what people are actually saying and what people are positions that people actually hold, right? So the same could be said about uh, Dave Snowden is a Marxist and a, Catholic, and a Catholic. We, the same thing could be said about Marxism, killed 100 million people. Um, I think metamodernism thus far is waiting for its first kill. Um, Catholicism is the worst, is the world's largest string of pedophiles. Uh, so if you support that, you might somehow support that uh, that practice as well. I'm not saying uh, this uh, this uh, uh, creates any guilt by association on, on Dave Snowden's positions. I'm just saying, let's not go there, guys. How about we keep it cleaner than that? And then the community at large needs to stand up and have some pride of high ethics of discourse. But it's not just the critics who breach, the, the critics of stage theories that breach norms. There's a reason that these norm breaches and others show up and that, they're, um, that they feel justified in them. And it's of course that they have experienced things that others have said, stage theorists have said, I go through uh, the, a, a walkthrough of the norms of using stage theory in the book, um, in the Listening Society. And well, it's a, it's a zip file, we won't go through them, but it's non judgment. It's remember that it's not a moral order, the stages of development. Remember to differentiate between natural hierarchies, 
like a student driver and and uh, um, and the driving instructor and dominator hierarchies like a master and a slave remember that it, a hierarchy in one domain does not transmit to another domain remember that humility is a virtue and and uh, is a mark of the farther development usually remember that there are different dimensions of development uh, of development remember that uh, developmental issues and stages must be uh, approached with with uh, social sensitivity which isn't easy well sorry guys Let's see backwards um and remember that um the stages are not all there is, so don't don't get tunnel visioned around them. But again, the reason that we're getting contra fire or counter fire so strongly is that people have been using stage theories as social weapons. This was exactly what Dave Snowden said, for instance. He said, well, he was at a conference, people said, yo, you wouldn't understand this, you're just blue or something, and, and he wore, wore badges of, of Brown or something, uh, and uh, Nora Bateson said something similar that her friend had been had her feelings hurt by uh, doing a test, and then they were the person wasn't scored as high enough state, and they were excluded from a context. Now those are bad practices, guys. <laughs> so if you want to use stage theory, you have to have because it's sensitive, because it's useful, because it's powerful. <laughs> The, the demands on ethics, on discursive, communicative hygiene become much higher, right? So we're getting the criticism we deserve. Uh, we're getting the critique we deserve because we're not keeping to our own ethics, the ethics that developmental uh, psychology and the stage theories themselves invite us to. Again, just to lay out the argument. Better hygiene is not boring. It leads to higher ethics, and that leads to less council culture, okay? So if you're stricter against norm breachers, you get less council culture because you have higher, better containers. That means you have more contained polarity in your field or your field of discourse. That means you have wider oscillations that the, that the mind stretches farther. And that means you have you, you fathom greater complexity and depth, or you triangulate towards greater complexity and depth. And that means you have greater emerging clarity and or potentially greater emerging clarity and coherence across the board. And that means a more beautiful and tremendous adventure together. And that means real results in relieved suffering in the world. And it's also more fun. All if we resist the fast carbs of drama. It's, it appears very fun with all of those insults and drama. We were so, somehow impressed that the person is brave, that they're upholding breaches of drama. I do it in the literature as well, uh, deliberately break norms, etc. But in the discourse, we know we all pay a price for it and we're gonna have less fun. Just adding a level of seriousness to this, we also know that in our high potential community, there are also a lot of uh, mental health issues. So understanding that, the, that this hygiene also protects people from mental health collapses and stuff like suicide, et cetera, uh, is important. Because remember that every time we go after somebody or try to smear them or whatever we do. There's a human being on the other side. We don't know what their situation is. Uh, we're interacting a lot through screens. It's difficult to be context sensitive, right? So by all means, let's use all of this stuff for the betterment of the quality of the discourse, even if that sometimes means ignoring some people until they apologize for, for their own breaches. Okay, contextualization two. So this other thing is a zip file. So it's a whole presentation. I've been giving it uh, once, twice, twice. Uh, one was uh, with the with the Pacific Integral folks. Uh, they they loved it, uh, but it's a one hour presentation or forty five minutes one hour presentation. Now I'll just do one slide, and I think a lot of people will recognize what I'm getting at. 
but we'll just stay with a zip file for, for, the, for the context of the argument that ensues. Number one, the first stage. The world is flat. You don't know about stage theory. It, do, it just doesn't make sense to you. You don't see the Piaget and, uh, stages of growth. You don't know about hierarch hierarchical complexity. You don't know about emergence. You don't know about layers of self-organization and so forth. And you study something else, maybe structures, maybe maybe discourses, maybe, uh, maybe just uh, flows in the economy, right? A lot of people can be really, really smart, just know, don't know about stage theories. And if they hear about them, they don't, they don't land in their minds because it doesn't make sense because you don't have enough other uh, supporting structures in your mind to, to support such claims. So that would be the first stage, right? Well, if you find out then about stage theories, you, us you usually go through a period of stage theory mania where everything looks like uh, um, the, the proverbial nail you can hit with your hammer. And, um, and you might even have a period of feeling special because you identify with later stages, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, there is a third level and though beyond that. And um, um, here's where, where the more informed critics tend to come from. So it's, they understand some of the stage theory stuff and they choose not to believe in it because it doesn't land with, with a wider contextualization they see, right? Mm. But then there is a nuanced defense of stage theory. You, you notice that, aha, there's stuff like path dependency at multiple dimensions. You can see that the critics who think it's too linear, they're using a, a crude or simplified version of stage theory. Just the fact that there are good and bad stage theories doesn't mean that there's nothing at all um, or that the critics can throw out the baby with the bathwater. And then the fifth stage, and the one that I'm trying to, to sort of land here in this discussion, and uh, that the, uh, this presentation also lands, and if, you, if we go through it all, is the yin and yang of stage and non-stage. Means something like this. So us who are stage theorists, um, and um, I would like to say sensitive stage theorists or critical stage theorists, we do not believe that stage theories should be a majority position in society. We do not believe that society would be a better place if everybody believed what we believe. We believe it's um, within the, the progressive or creative or, or let's say high potential, high, highly creative uh, um, sphere, let's say the metamodernist, et cetera, metamodernist and friends. We believe that most people should believe in stage theories because it gives a sense of directionality. However, there have been societies where one stage theory gets a dominant position. And we know them as Marxist societies. So Marxist theories, one, one version of, or of them or another, gained a position, very strong position in society, and everything else was engaged with one and the same stage theory. So the communist countries said, we're at a higher stage than the, than the capitalist countries. So now we're going to do socialist art. And you had all sorts of, of crazy, crazy, crazy oppression and, and uh, just, just um, short circuiting of the mind. <laughs> um, and misuses, of course, and excuses for all sorts of injustices in the name of these stage theories. So, so it's not the state, the, the goal of our stage theories, theorists is not to um, take over the world and make everybody believe in what we say. We want the majority to not believe in us. But we believe that the minority of people who are have, have the highest potential, or some of them have the highest potential of transforming, taking new direction society, do need to understand some stage theories sometimes. We also believe, however, this golden cut continues, right? So among the let's say metamodernists, postmodernists, people who people who um, uh, people who uh, are part of the transformation of society, let's say, and it's it's uh, it's an uh, edge of transformation or or self reflection. We need a third or so, a third of or, or uh, maybe a quarter of people who don't believe in stage theory. 
first of all, they, they are uh, sort of a bridge to the rest of everybody. And second of all, um, they make sure that the stage theorists don't get tunnel vision and pathological. So there's, this, there's really a fractal pattern here that main sustained society should not uh, should not be, be believing in stage theories. They should have minority of people who do. Within that minority, you should have a minority again who don't. Maybe we can continue the fractal for a little while at, at more abstract levels. But you can see it's part of the same ecosystem. And it's not the position in and of itself. It's the process of truth seeking or the, or the social process. A eats B, B eats C, C eats A. And that's how it should be. That's as it should be. Because it, it, um, it protects against totalitarianism, which is one of the risks of any, of any grand schemes or theories. The third contextualization we have is to differentiate between six meanings of metamodernism. So, I mean, even to, ha to, have, to even have a real starter on this, on this topic, we really need to differentiate this. It's also a zip file, but I'll also do it in one slide. I'll try to be quick about it. To meaningfully talk about this, we must differentiate between metamodernism as six different things a cultural phase, a sort of artistic sensibility that has grown over the last couple of decades, a structure of feeling, let's say, that art scholars and others have, have identified in, in um, architecture and in, in, uh, the popular culture and the arts and so forth and literature. Um, and that's one, one aspect the widest and most well-known aspect of what metamodernism can mean. However, it's also a stage of personal development. So we can sometimes say some, this guy is pretty metamodern. He might not know, or this woman is pretty metamodern. We might, they, he or she might not know about um, any metamodernist theory. We can just notice the structure of how they are thinking, their personality, their values. Um, and we can say, aha, there, there's a pattern here that I recognize, and that's measurable and comparable to other things. That's a structural personality, and it must have, it must have arisen in a, certain, in a certain social context that allowed for that to rise. Or it can be a stage of societal development, modern society, postmodern modernity, metamodern society. That's, of course, what I've been writing about earlier. Um, but now I'm uh, working on uh, on another book, or my my partner, uh, or writer partner, particularly is working on it. Is another level of abstraction up from from a stage of societal development. We call it a meta meme. It's an abstract pattern. So there's a pattern of patterns, like a pattern that connects, um, that can also meaningfully be called meta modern. Or metamodernism can be movement. So this loose gathering of people, including a bunch of Facebook groups, including a bunch of meetups that people have, including a bunch of uh, writers and their followers, including a bunch, like some political parties, some uh, business groups, and other things like that. And this is, of course, what people mean when they write on their LinkedIn profile, I'm a metamodernist. Um, so, so they mean they to, to signify a, a, an affiliation with this group or, or culture. And um, and it can be a philosophy. So uh, so uh, there are a lot of people who wouldn't denominate themselves as metamodernists, uh, but uh, but you could easily see metamodern metamodernist elements in their philosophy, including actually the the, the two ones that, that I mentioned uh, that are critics of stage theories, um, Nora Bateson and and, uh, and Dave Snowden. So, um, so, so th there's, there's a sort of pattern to how philosophy has been developing over the last, uh, over the last decade or so, uh, where, where there are certain themes that you can recognize. We won't go into it, but just knowing which one we're talking about makes a whole lot of difference 
when we're talking about whether or not metamodernism is a good thing or a bad thing, whether it's dangerous or useful, whether it has high potential or little potential at all. Um, and it's uh, a very useful thing to know either way if you're part of all this, because it just clarifies a lot of things. So you can be part of a metamodernist clique or movement, but you can notice that people in it don't always live up to the stage of personal development. You can see that um, uh, artists express the phase without talking about the philosophy. You can see that there are philosophers who express a certain uh, sort of development in their in their thinking and so forth, right? So all of these crisscross, but if you look at this complex ontological object, all of these six crisscrossing dimensions, you get what metamodernism actually is. That's the whole, that's the big part, right? Patterns are everywhere. Well, I just thought somehow this fits here. Sometimes you can't see them, but they're there. Am I a pattern? So that concludes the preparatory part. I think we're doing okay on time, actually. I, I worry this preparation part would be too long. Um, so the main dish will, uh, is going to take up um, it's going to take up a uh, um, little more time and mental space. I almost suggest we take a one minute break or something just so I can keep people's attention uh, because I just gave these three uh, these three cons um, contextualizations and, uh, and for the main dish uh, we're going to go through a lot of content a lot of arguments and so forth. Um, so uh, so how about we just take a breather one minute, I'll stretch my legs and uh, we'll be right back. This looks about right. Yep. Hello, Ellen made it just for the for, for the main dish. Um, yeah, so so basically I'll bring up argument for argument stuff that's being said about metamodernism, about stage theories, and, and how these things fit together or not. And uh, and I'll just uh, I'll I'll just uh, reply. And well, more or less, I can say already, it's a good thing not to do this in a dialogue, because the arguments are overwhelmingly on the side of um, um, of metamodernism and as a stage theory and so forth. So it, it's almost an impossible social situation to go through all of it with another person in the room that has the opposite argumentation. It's a carpet bombing, basically. And um, yeah, that doesn't mean that I don't think that other people uh, should have the opposite position or the opposite uh, argument. Um, it just means um, I think we shouldn't be throwing the baby out with the bathwater. People who meaningfully engage with stage theories and metamodernism understood as such are necessary and important. So don't be ashamed of yourselves, stand up for it. It's okay, you're gonna have your fair share of critics. It's part of the process. It's even fun 
And if you want, you can always use all of these arguments and there's nothing, I mean, they're not left standing on, on, a, on both legs, right? Uh, but uh, again, be sensitive about it. Um, you use, use with care. If, if all the critics of metamodernism call, and, and stage theories call me up tomorrow morning and say, we will now start using stage theories in our work, et cetera, I don't think the world would be a better place. I think everything has its place and we should have a wider community with a minority of people who don't believe in any of this stuff and who think folks like me are full of shit. That's important because it keeps things balanced and non-totalitarian and open-ended, right? So let's take on, on some of the arguments. So the first one, and this is a popular one, it's things don't progress in linear stages. Hmm. It's too linear, right? It can't be that simple. It's too linear. So first of all, the, 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 the first note, and this is an important takeaway, is all stage theories are by definition nonlinear. That's the whole point of them, right? So if you, <laughs> if you, um, uh, take a stage theory like uh, between traditionalism, modernity, and postmodernity, you're saying traditionalism produces, I don't know, uh, monks and nuns. And if you produce enough monks and nuns, you get destabilization, reform, uh, the, 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 the reformation, stuff like that, stuff like that. And eventually, a phase shift into modernity from traditionalism. And you start producing an army of businessmen and scientists, right? So how did the problem, <laughs> the propagation of so many monks and nuns create an army of businessmen and scientists? It's nonlinear. You, you shifted the dynamics, right? The pattern shifted and you produce enough businessmen and scientists. What, what do their kids do? They run out and hug trees and, and walk pride parades and protest uh, war efforts and write intellectual papers on, on uh, the, the hegemony of certain forms of language use. How did that come about by so many, by so many business people and, uh, and scientists, natural scientists? Well, because it's a nonlinear shift again, right? That's the whole point. So sure, you can draw a line, you can, if you draw them on a paper, you can draw a straight line, so that might look linear, but the whole idea of stage theories is that they're not linear. That's the that's the main I, that's the main point of them. Um, so all of these um, this one is close to home for me. I have a little baby. because she couldn't control her hands and fingers. Now she's one and she picks her nose. If she follows the developmental path of 99% of the population, she will one day stop picking nose in public and only do it with social discernment. So we have just identified three different stages of behavior. It's, it's a trivial stage theory but it describes almost all humans universally, right? There are going to be culture variations, but some version of this exists across the board. Is it contextual? Sure. Elephants don't go through the same stages. But given those contexts, we have hands and so forth, it's a universal pattern. So it's that easy to construct a meaningful stage theory that describes a real occurring pattern. So if somebody says stage theories don't exist, they don't describe anything that is out there in the world, they're just wrong. So um, yeah, 
I mean, we can also ask why why are lines bad and evil in the first place? Why is linear bad? People are always, you know, linear is good, organic is or linear is bad, organic uh, mycelium is good. Why exactly? We're, we never get a real real answer to that question. It's just assume sort of lines are lines are bad, or linear is bad, right? Um, mm. And lines are a part of reality, right? So if you're against lines, you're trying to rip out a necessary part of reality. Mm. So if you've said path dependency, if you've conceded that development occurs at all according to path dependent lines, then you've said that there is stage theory developed, that, there, that stage theories can describe them. I mean, it, at least if you accept nonlinearity, otherwise you could just add incrementally, I suppose, and then you would have linear theories. But if you are against stages, that means that makes you linear, right? Because that means you just add more and more to, to uh, with, without phase shifts, right? So this argument doesn't hold up. They always come up. It's like, it's linear, it's linear. Doesn't make any sense, guys. Doesn't make any sense. So this one, metamodernism is only a cultural phase. It cannot be a stage because stage theories are bad. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this one, this, I, this is one made by, by Dave Snowden. So there are good and bad stage theories. We'll be back to that one. Um, but the main counter argument here, I mean, sure, there are good and bad stage theories. So, um, just because there are some bad stage theories doesn't mean that all stage theories are bad, but yeah. Um, but wait a minute for a cultural object to be seen and recognized, let alone created, there has to be a subject that acts upon it. So what I'm saying is, if you accept that the cultural phase of metamodernism exists, so there are movies that are metamodern and artwork that's metamodern and and uh, uh, plays and 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 um, architecture and so forth, and there there are metamodern practices or metamodern logics or sentiments that are out there in the world, who's actually doing those things? Who's actually noticing those things? Well, it has to be somebody there seeing it, and it has to awaken something in that person. There has to be a, a mirror within the subject that sees the object, right? So if metamodernism exists as culture out there in the world, there's somebody participating in that culture, right? So if you concede that metamodernism exists as a cultural phase, which all the cultural metamodernists do, uh, then, and this is what the cultural modernists do not, then you also accept that ultimately there must be such a thing as metamodernism, a stage of personal development. And if it exists as a stage of personal development, there is going to be a corresponding stage of, um, of um, societal development. Then there's going to be a corresponding abstract pattern in, uh, out there in reality that can meaningfully be described as metamodernism. And that means there's going to be a philosophy that can describe that. And then there's going to be a, a movement that can carry forward that philosophy. So all of the six meanings are contained within this argument. So no, it's not just a cultural phase. Metamodernism meaningfully exists as a developmental stage. Stage theories could lead to bad stuff, so they must be false. Now, this is true. But uh, stage theories can lead to bad stuff, like Marxism or, or uh, my own stuff has uh, been attempted to use, uh, been being used in cults, etc. But if you just logic check it, right, um, at the at the risk of being tedious, but the, the logic check here is that <laughs> if you um, um, if just because you don't like something doesn't make it not true. So uh, nuclear reactors can be used for bad stuff. That does not mean nuclear reactors does not exist. Sorry. So, so you cannot use a should argument for, for an is, 
support his argument. But to answer the ethical concern, the underlying ethical concern, it's the case that stage theories require higher ethics and more contextualization than other theories, as we've been talking about, or else they can lead to nasty practices. And remember the hospital analogy. We have to keep the ethics as impeccable as we can, the communicative ethics as impeccable as we can. We have to just keep it, keep the hygiene up, right? Or else stage theories lead, do lead to bad stuff. So this one uh, is, is uh, from, from Nora Bateson's cyberneticist perspective. There, where's the edge of the deer, she says. Um, and the idea here is that things adapt in contextual layers. So the individual objects of analysis cannot have inherent properties such as stages. So, so she's, or, or, or that's how I imagine the argument because I, I never hear the second part. They just sort of stay on that part, like where's the edge of the deer? And then as a way of relativizing the fact that the deer might have a certain stage of cognitive development. And the idea I suppose, well, for instance, a fly imitates in its development, in its uh, physiological development, a wasp to scare off predators. So it's a second and third order feedback loop, part of the ecology. So it imitates its own predator so it won't get eaten. Or it imitates the predator of its predator, right? So, so there are several loops of several layers of feedback there. And that, that's, the, that's the argument. Now, and um, with, with, the, with Snowden's words here, was developmental ways, or, or metamodernism in his words was extreme atomism, right? But if you, we can stop and think about this. I'm, I'm a little bit unsure why, why this argument sticks. So, um, I mean, if you do a, a reductio ad absurdum here, you can, you can look at something like a rock. It's also affected by things that are affected by things. So it's part of second and third order feedback loops. It's part of ecologies and so forth. It's also in a flux. I mean, the, even the, the stone slowly, slowly floats and melts. Um, it also rises in contexts. But that doesn't mean we can't compare its complexity to a mouse, right? Or it means, or we can still compare its complexity to a mouse, and we're going to see that the mouse is a lot more complex than the stone. So just because something co-rises with other things and interacts with them and is part of an environment doesn't mean it doesn't have properties. So, for instance, that pigeons are part of ecologies does not make them pink. And um, and uh, pink being a property of that object or organism. Um, same thing with uh, with developmental properties. You can have um, you can have um, more co complex cognition. You can have um, you can have um, a host of different uh, senses that that animals can develop, or or sensitivity of those senses, or sens sensitivities to different uh, parts of the electromagnetic magnetic scale, or whatever. But these things exist just because there. It's just because the deer is part of a larger ecology doesn't mean that the deer is not a four-legged animal with um, uh, with hairs on its body, right? So the boundaries are blurred does not mean that there are no meaningful objects. So, and besides, it should be pointed out that all metamodernists are anti-atomists and extreme contextualists. So. Uh, developmentalism or metamodernism is not an extreme form of animism. Uh, my own work flows directly from the social psychological classics of the self as social. Um, that is a through line in, in uh, our first and second books. Uh, there is a chapter or sub chapter called death to individual death to the individual. Um, so I mean, again, th this goes back to to uh, 
hygiene of argumentation that you have to not straw man people. You have to, if, you, if you're going to go after people really hard on their, uh, on their positions, you have to at least check those positions or else don't, don't waste everybody's time. You interact with the environment, so you can't be a certain stage. Yeah. Um, so same as the same as the other one um, that you're always part of a larger of a, or me a person uh, is always part of a larger context. I'll be different in different contexts, and because I'm different in different contexts, you can't actually say I'm, I'm at a certain stage. Well, I do vary in which stages I can express in terms of uh, values or or uh, thought patterns or behaviors, emotional responses depending on which context I'm in. Uh, but again, and, and sure, if, if we do uh, do an absurd reduction here, if I, I do in fact in, interact with the surface of the sun, that means I will be stage zero, of course. Mm. But do not forget, it takes a whole lot of interaction for dust to lie around and evolve into Shakespeare. So that does not make dust into Shakespeare. Dust and Shakespeare are not the same. Shakespeare has a higher stage of complexity of emergence, including cognitive complexity, than dust. So just because we arise through interactions with the environment does not mean we don't have particular properties, including state properties that can be meaningfully described with stage theories that are tied to us as organisms. However, though, um, there's this thing called scaffolding. Um, so uh, the context can, can scaffold plus or minus two, two stages of complexity on, on something that's called the model of hierarchical complexity. Longer story. So sure, we're very, very, very contextual, but that doesn't mean we don't have a particular stage property. A particular stage property, you say? Wouldn't it be better describe a human being in her richness at, of, across multiple stages? Because development is so multidimensional, there are so many things to learn and so many things to develop and so many things to change and transform that you can't meaningfully talk about one stage. And this is where it gets a little bit more complex, actually. Stages consist of attractor points or attractor basins or plateaus in, in complex topologies. And let's let's do an example. So let's let's take the stage postmodern, that you have a postmodernist mind. Mm -hmm. That means let, let, let's let's take a few different postmodernist positions. So social constructionism is one, that the world is socially constructed or the social world, the society is socially constructed, including the mind, the structures of the mind. Multiperspectivalism, cultural relativism, and that tends to lead to social justice positions because while one, if cultures are relative, one major majority culture shouldn't be oppressing the smaller minority cultures or, or, or the, the delinquents, so to speak, of that society. And that means you start looking for critiques. And that means you start using deconstruction. You start deconstructing the main narratives or the, the mainstream narratives. And that means you start to focus on power and the nature of interactions. And that means you have a resistance to positivism uh, or to, to uh, you know, dumb down empirical science and to the hegemony of scientific discourses uh, or scientifically clad discourses, for instance, in psychiatrics. So if you have one of these positions, the next one becomes more likely for you to adopt. They're all different positions. There are different books. There are a thousand books on each of these topics. However, 90% of postmodern scholars will have all of these positions. They will adopt all of these positions because they, if you've already adopted five of them, the sixth one makes so much sense. At a sixth one, the seventh one, it makes even more sense. 
you have um, you have an attractor point because these um, reinforce one another. So the different stages are attractor basins or plateaus that all arise in multi-dimensional typologies. So that means, sure, development can be cognitive, it can be emotional, it can be existential, it can be phys uh, can have to do with your with your um, phenomenology or 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 uh, uh, physical composure. It can have to do with your communication skills. It can have to do with your with your um, education or your life experience. It can have to do with many different things. However, there are patterns that hold across those different dimensions. So metamodernists, for instance, are usually either highly complex minds or very spiritually developed. But somehow we have all these highly complex and spiritually developed people hanging out because they somehow reach reson resonance with one another or, or, or come into resonance with one another. Why is that? Because it's a stage that arises across in a, as a pattern across many different dimensions. And all topologies are multidimensional. So there's no surprise there. So so the so metamodernism, let's say as a developmental state, is gonna look different in one person than another. It might look radically different, but there is still something, some sort of correspondence, some sort of resonance between them. That's the simplicity on the other side of the complexity, right? So there is a complexity there, but it's easy to lose our way looking at all of those complexity, uh, all, all of those uh, complexifying factors. Once we see the larger patterns that recur across many different contexts, we can see that, aha, it's actually often surprisingly simple that people go from mostly modern-ish minds to mostly postmodern-ish minds to mostly metamodernist minds. That's a shocking finding, but it appears to be true. Materialism is better uh, because it studies what's actually there. So an abstract pattern like metamodernism can't be relevant. This this is uh, coming from the, the more Marxist-ish critique of, of, um, of uh, Snowden's uh, talk. So materialism is better. Mm -hmm. So materialism meaning in the Marxist sense, for instance, that uh, you look at, uh, well, real material affordances of people, uh, that you look at, uh, at material conditions, that you look at power relations, uh, um, that you look at the distributions of wealth, uh, of resources, stuff like that. Um, and that you find that those tend to have strong explanatory power. And if you really want to change society, you need to not be distracted by, I don't know, new age gurus or something. And you need to work for, for real change, such as, such as empowering the poor or redistrib redistribution of wealth or pre-distribution of wealth or something along those lines, right? Or, or the, the organization of uh, organizing into wider um, groups, if you have a joint interest, for instance, a class interest. So, okay, I mean, it's important we don't get distracted from, from uh, material realities. I couldn't, couldn't, couldn't disagree with that. But the whole idea of complex thinking is that reality is multidimensional. If you think about it, materialism says material, material reality is most real and matters the most. So it's a sort of reductionism. So yes, material reality does cut through everything. I made a material, I made a matter, for instance. But all matter is organized informationally in its relational interactions. And that's that in and of itself, you wouldn't exactly call material. And information in feedback loops is a property of the mind. So the mind, when it thinks, works in information working on other information. So you wouldn't exactly call that material reality. So I, my point is, our ideas also shape material conditions and realities. Of course they do. So they also act upon the world. So 
you can't just write off uh, uh, an abstract pattern like metamodern is because it's non-material. Uh, and uh, hence, real, equally real structures exist in matter and mind. And that, I mean, this is, this is basic stuff, really. I mean, it, Aristotle said as much. He said there's material reality, then there's the causal finale, and, um, and that there, there's the causal structure of, of this particular thing. But a simple example here, uh, just a really coup de grace against materialism, is where is the material reality of Marx's doctrine? So I mean, sure, the classes are there. I, I'm not going to argue with the with that being a material reality, but the ideas of Karl Marx, they're little books, right? I mean, it's not a huge material reality. No, that's in people's minds. It's ideational reality. Did it have material consequences in the world? Yeah. So that means Marxism itself undercuts the, the reality of, of Marxist uh, doctrine in the world undercuts any belief in material in you know reductionist materialism. The fact that Marxism, a set of ideas, had th that sort of high impact in the world means that you cannot be a materialist reductionist. Uh, it just, just doesn't make any sense. So, and by the way, no, this is not a Carthesian dualism I'm, uh, I'm introducing. Um, it's uh, m matter and information, materials and ideas are ever intertwined. They're part, part of the same reality. So, now we're drawing to final countdown here. This one I particularly like. It, nothing in nature resembles stage theory. This is, um, I, know, I, I believe, one of known as arguments. Um, so let's look at this one. This is chaos theory, the bifurcation diagram, eigenbounds constant. So can you guys see my, uh, my pointer? Yep, you can. Um, so the phi, the bifurcation diagram is it, very interesting. It's it's how how things. I mean, for instance, you put on a tap of water and and you increase the pressure. First, it's going to drip, 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 drip once, and that's this first that's this first uh, line here. Eventually, it flips and starts doing drip, 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 drip two drips at a time, and then. It, uh, it goes, uh, you, you increase the pressure a little more and it does four drips. Drip, 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 Then it goes to eight, then it goes to 16. And soon it hits chaos and it starts to, uh, uh, to behave chaotically, uh, entirely randomly as, as it were, reg irregularly. So this, this, Bifurcation diagram has been found across nature, and you can try this at home with a, with a tap if you want. Um, and you go six, seven, eight bifurcation. Bifurcation means every time you you split in two, right? So from one drip to drip drip, right? And this, then you go to four. Each time, each time comes a little faster. So you can you can go and how much faster? About four point seventy is uh, sixty seven times faster. It's, I'm simplifying a little bit, but this is Feigenbaum's constant then. And the interesting part is, if you look at the stages of development in the history, in cultural history, uh, you have something like uh, um, you have something like. Uh, uh, archaic history or, or, or you have something like the emergence of modern humans two or three hundred thousand years ago and then to two point or, or about 4.67 times faster uh, so around uh, or, or shorter time ago uh, you have the emergence of uh, animist culture the, the, the cognitive explosion in, uh, in uh, the, the Paleolithic times. After that, you have something like the, the emergence of agricultural society, also roughly 
for Faustian society, also roughly 4.76 times faster. After that, you have the next stage, traditional society, 2.5 thousand years ago, the axial age, the modernity, about 500 years ago. Then you have post-modernity about 100 years ago. Then you have metamodernity about uh, 20 years ago. So we're actually already following roughly this pattern. And after metamodernity, uh, it, the, this goes, this usually goes six, seven, eight uh, repetitions of bifurcation before it hits chaos. So likely, if if these bifurcations correspond to the to the growth of of the different uh, stages of development in the human culture, uh, they, they we're reaching a point where these stage theories will no longer meaningfully describe what goes on. We will we'll hit chaos. We'll do some sort of uh, transition. And if you think about it, it makes sense, right? So. I mean, we all know metamodernism has showed up very recently, and postmodernism was much more recent than, than modernity, modernity being something like 500 years. So it can't just continue and go faster and faster, right? So people will mention, you know, minuscule shifts in stages or, or a stage eight or stuff. And after that, as cr the critics have pointed out, the stage theories tend to get weird and people start stage stacking and they get fantastic and, and they get new aging and so forth. But likely we look a lot, we're, what we're looking at is, uh, is an actual progression of seven stages, then maybe an eighth one. And then we're gonna hit some sort of different dynamic, right? But this is a resemblance, a pretty profound one. And you can read my whole article about it on Medium or on metamoderna.org. By the way, if you watch the videos on, on this Feigenbaum's uh, constant and the bifurcation diagram, you're going to find that if you turn it around and you watch it from another dimension, it looks like this. Ah, it's the Mandelbrot set. And the Mandelbrot set is nothing less than the uh, most um, the most universal pattern of fractals we know about which says something that about the nature of stage theories that aha uh -huh, if there are patterns in complex topologies and they follow chaos theory and they they can be described in a fractal pattern we're probably looking at the stages being a surface phenomenon or a surface description of a deeper pattern that is actually fractal based. But that's a story for another day. All I'm saying is there are things in nature that resemble stage theory. Let's go on. This is fun. Semantics. You add on the frequency and the pattern gets uh, thinner and thinner and thinner and thinner. Blah, 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 blah. Uh, on, uh, this is sand on a, on a membrane. And then the pattern blows up. There's a phase transition, and then a new pattern emerges. Nonlinear stage transitions. Hmm. They come faster and faster, by the way. Looks exactly like stage theories. And by the way, the same matter in all of these it's the same sound. <laughs> so you can't be a material reductionist. They're, these are patterns, man. It's a pattern that connects, patterns of patterns. For life, you know, I mean, uh, I, I, I also, uh, there are a lot of things I, I liked in, in uh, uh, David Snowden's talk. I, uh, um, for instance, I agree with him on, on his, uh, his ideas or his position on Rupert Sheldrake. I feel that's pseudoscience stuff. I um, also feel actually that uh, Ian McGilchrist ca uh, can be over overrated um, for for slightly different reasons than, than, uh, than he has mentioned. But there is an alternative to Rupert Sheldrake. It's not the only holistic biologist out there. Dennis Noble just passed away, and if you look at his um, his uh, uh, model of expression of of, um, of levels of emergence in um, life, uh, you actually find 
the same progression roughly. Um, you, you, you can, um, I mean, let's skip the organism one, but up until that, you actually have seven stages. The organism is just the whole. Uh, so, so it looks something like that, right? It, 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 it complexifies, it complexifies, it complexifies, and it, boom, you have something else, right? And a complete other dynamic of organisms interacting instead. And yes, the, the stages interact continuously. So it wouldn't be so strange if our minds work in a similar manner. Or you can look at whole ecologies. Now, now that we're here with in um, in uh, uh, the biological sciences, uh, this one is nice. Uh, you also see you see a similar you see a similar uh, number of, of stages. Bonita Roy is writing. Um, or you can see a regular. You can see the different. Hi, Daniel. Uh, okay, so uh, we, I, I'm sharing screen, Bonita. If you can remove that stuff, I'm not sure. Uh, so, so a regular, um, a regular periodic. Uh, well, just just if you go from atomic molecular to macromolecular to unicellular to smaller metazoan to larger metazoan to sociocultural ecological. You also have roughly the same number of stages and with clear phase transition. Yes, there is something in nature that looks like stage theory. And of course, stage th string theory looks like stage theory, my favorite. Yeah. Um, and math looks like stage theory. You add another dimension and stir every, uh, like, you, you can add a truckload of line to one line, nothing's going to happen until you add another dimension. Boom, you get a square. You add another dimension, you get a cube. So you get interesting hypercubes of different sorts. And yes, that's how the mind also works. You work on something out until you triangulate something entirely unexpected, and that new unexpected thing can move to whichever position of the of the mental space that you just traversed, which is exactly the definition of a, of, a de of a dimension. So yeah, mathematics it works the same way. So there is stuff in nature that looks like stage theory. Uh, yeah, I mean, people are, you, you, can, you can look at my, my uh, uh, acquaintance, uh, Bob Izari, and he's also part of this uh, arch disciplinary research center where, where we gather all of these different things. Uh, he, he wrote a book, Romance of Reality. I don't agree with all the positions he has in that book, uh, but uh, he um, he is really, really good at um, listing all the interesting names here. So, I mean, you, you have similar patterns in Lee Smolin's physics, you have in newer science, uh, you of course have the, the larger uh, thing of going from matter to life to culture, all follows stage theory. You have universal computation. Computation in and of itself can be uh, created in stage theory. I'm involved in one such project myself with my friend Johan Ranaforce. So, last one, last one, guys. Um, I mean, even if we accept what I, all of the stuff I just said, okay, so there are these stage varieties in, in, in uh, the, these phase shifts in, in, in nature. Um, I just don't like your drawing, right? Look at it. It's like a staircase. This is Keegan, right? I, I also don't like Keegan's staircase, by the way. So there's a lot of stuff that doesn't make sense here. But first of all, it's unidimensional. I'm not, not in love with it. But but here here's Keegan's uh, um, staircase. And sure, I mean, it looks pretty linear. Yeah, it looks, you know, square in a sense. Let's see, should continue. Um, so, so I can see where you're coming from that, yeah, uh, that would lead people towards, the stage theories presented this way would lead state people towards a sort of more square and boxy thinking where you try to box people into these different stages and stuff. 
So you can draw it otherwise, of course. Like so, you can do this one, concentric circles, a little nicer, maybe. You can, it looks at the multidimensionality of it more and it un understands that it's it's not about climbing higher and then looking down on others. It's about uh, embracing wider embraces uh, of of, the, of uh, former perspectives and inclusion and the capacity of partaking in the in that in those processes of, of uh, deeper inclusion. Uh, but if uh, this one also, after all, is sort of hierarchical, and this one is better, uh, and which I prefer a lot more. This is from uh, my friend Joe Lightfoot's blog, and Joe he he skips a couple of, of stages here and all. You know, it's, it's not it's not his profession to be a stage theorist, but he just discusses the issue, and what he did here is genius. So the, it's a tree now, and the big, huge trunk is indigenous, right? The first stage is the longest and the most fundamental and, and the oldest, and where the roots are. And uh, if you look at the indigenous cultures around the world, they're much more varied and interesting and older and more, in a sense, de developed than young cultures like our little upstart, right? We, we did not, like the sand people, uh, stick around for 30,000 years, right? We're new and we're still trying stuff out, right? And on that, you have, well, again, he skips stages, but I'll just go with his stuff here. Traditional, but on the out branch of that, you have cosmopolitan, modern, and an out branch of that, you have holistic and an out, or, or postmodern. And on an out, as in the small out branch of that, you have metamodern. And the difference between them is smaller and smaller. Now imagine we sh we shift this stuff like the, like we turn it over like this. What would you get? The bifurcation diagram. Yep. So the first the first thing looks a lot like like the the roots where we stuck around the longest time, and then the differences become smaller and smaller. Right? I mean, most people can't tell the difference between postmodernists and metamodernists. Only actually metamodernists can tell the difference between postmodernists and metamodernists. Um, and whereas if you look at the difference between modernity and, and the Stone Age, uh, the birds can tell the difference, right? <laughs> it's, it's more obvious, right? And so, um, yeah, if you draw it like this, a lot of the allergies fall away, right? So I think a lot of the resistance, except for failures of communication and, and, and ethics on, on our side, the, the, the community of stage people, um is that we also draw it wrong we draw it to in, in a way that turns people off and uh and uh and that makes them suspicious and for good reason so i really like this innovation that he, that joe came up with here yeah last please growth is much more democratic than people think so I, I, all the stuff i've been talking about is within the realm of grow up that stage development but remember there's also wake up so, you know, high stage or low, you can still, you know, be spiritually developed and have access high states. Uh, you can clean your shit up and, uh, you know, not have family traumas, uh, uh, you know, sneaking after your every footstep and, and poisoning your relationships. You can show up, like, uh, even if you do all the, the other things, you're not going to be president if you don't show up, right? And get up six in the morning, bam, 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 right? And, you know, get your shit together. That's also a thing. And, you know, if, if I look at myself, I'm probably good at grow up, but not so much at show up. I'm still working on that part. And other people I know are much better at show up. And if you look at it, you know, an open up is more about sexuality, being in love with life, stuff like that, um, being attuned. Uh, to 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 the pleasures and 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 tragedies of existence. So if you look at all of these things um, together, you see that the distribution is actually not elitist, right? So the grow up people usually have paid a huge price to grow so much. Uh, for instance, in cleanup stuff, which compromises mental health. Let's see, do I still have time? I still have minutes. Uh, I'm I'm sorry, guys. I, I, I might have uh, overgone, like, I put too much stuff in here. Let's see. Um, there we go. 
So why does metamodernism as a stage matter? It gives a sense of directionality. That's why it's important. So ah, we're not going towards a sense of techno-utopia. We're going towards a sense of inclusive development, self-reflection. We cannot purify the world with social justice, as is the postmodern creed. We must create caring, supporting structures, supportive structures that further inner growth. We now have a map of the elements to heal, transcend, and include for inner growth to occur. Pretty useful. Don't throw it away. Inner growth means contextualization of the self, and that means greater universality. So inner growth is the path towards universal values. We can't force universal values. They have to come from within. That has to come from inner growth. And then we have to know the map of growth. And this is required for us to create the right interactions between us for us to manage wicked issues and existential risks. So without supporting inner growth across society, we will not be able to realistically interact with one another in ways where we can handle these wicked issues because they're so relational and existential risks. And if we fail to grow, then we fall apart, we suffer, and we die. And growth can only come about through healing and ethical conduct. The means do not justify the end. It's the other way around. Uh, uh, the end does not justify the means. It's the other way around. The means justify the ends. You have to show it in your ethical conduct where you're going with every step, right? And we must act as ethically we can at all times. And it has to be our top priority to consider the highest ethics possible to try to understand what is the highest ethical ethics that can guide our actions. Right? All of these things become crystal clear if you see the directionality of the developmental pathway. And if you don't see that, you throw something away, a sense of shared direction in a confusing time. So again, remember the thing I said about golden ratio between metamodernists, or let's say metamodernists and stage theorists, metamodernists who also accept stage theory, and the critics within, within and without, without the mainstream society, but within the people who are also sort of metamodernists but don't like stage theories, we're part of an ecosystem. We do not want to destroy one another. Right. We do not want the other side to cease existing. Maybe the others actually do want this side to cease existing. But the, but the inclusive or holistic and open-ended stage theorists want a healthy ecosystem. We want the critics, right? Of course, we want them, of course, as long as they um, behave according to, to, to OK ethical standards. So, and maybe we can't then be exactly friends, the, the, the stage theorists and the anti-stage theorists, but we can be meta friends. We can be part of a larger structure where we understand at some level that we need each other. Uh, and we can let that meta friendship maybe guide our actions towards, towards a, a higher interaction that would not have been possible without the critics. So for instance, this has been a little creative endeavor that I've been doing today and putting this thing together. I would not have done it if it weren't for the critics, right? So it's, it's a value add that comes from having this sort of openness, an open-ended system, right? Which is, by the way, at the higher stages, uh, paradigmatic is all about Gödel's and completeness theorem, uh, all about paradox, all about sound of both hands clapping. Oh, well, I shouldn't clap my hands. Both hands clapping, right? Not both hands, both hands clapping, right? Um, but we can heal the world together. And we can heal the world together if we, if we are good steward, stewards of this field of emergence. That's my point. Okay, thanks everyone. Uh, it's, <laughs> we have 30 seconds for questions. Sorry, guys. <laughs> you can probably just go and say goodbye or something like that. All right. Thank you, Daniel. Um, and uh, are you okay to stay maybe 10, 10 minutes? Uh, we can stay yeah, sure, minutes. sure. I mean, so for me, so for me, I'm good on time. It's just, I mean, cool. I want to be respectful of 
the schedule here. Yeah, I, I can stay at 10 more minutes so we can sneak in a couple of questions. Um, I'll, I'll ask a, a question um, tying in the first part and the second part of your presentation. Uh, so how do you see discourse, uh, discourse hygiene relate to stage development? Um, like, do you have to be at an integrative stage or uh, a branch and like like foot's diagram to be uh, discourse hygienic? Um, maybe a cheeky way to ask this question, what stage do you think Dave Snowden is at? Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. No, so so I, I think uh, Dave Snowden is a metamodernist. I mean, there's just no way he'd have all of those insights and interests. Um, you know, it's, I mean, I, I don't want to force my labels on people uh, because if he hates the term, I mean, make doesn't make sense. But, but, but I mean, to me, to me, that's, you know, same, same, roughly, roughly. So it's, uh, you know, a, a meta friend and an ally. Uh, uh, this is a person who works for reintegrating spirituality. This is a person who works for uh, critically reevaluating the, uh, the, um, power relations in society. This is a person who works for, for cosmopolitan values and who wants to uh, differentiate between different forms of complexity. All of which makes just makes deep sense. He loves Manuel de Landa. I love Manuel de Landa. I mean, uh, it's, uh, so, so, so for me, I, I think rather, uh, I think rather sometimes um, our differences get the best of us. Sometimes they, uh, and sometimes they uh, they prove to be a, an unexpected boon, right? And um, so we have to be very strict on on the discourse ethics, but also have to be non-judgmental towards people and understand that uh, yeah, you know, usually people in this this uh, wider context are, are you know well-intentioned or they wouldn't have been here. Um, but hey, we're all human; we can all get seduced, et cetera, et cetera. And um, I wouldn't mix stage too much with with discourse ethics i would just say that i would just say that it's a high stage stance to focus on the quality of the process uh, and it, it's a it's a more it's a more low stage stance to focus on uh the, the the content or position, right? I mean, you always have to bar certain things. Uh, like if you, we have a discussion, let's let's kill this minority. Like, like no, we're gonna have to cancel that discussion, right? Or we're gonna well, let's hang Daniel. Like, no, 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 or let's not go there. Right? But uh, barring those those few things, uh, we should have an as open content as possible. And there's a difference then between lower stage people are gonna be. I'm not going to, oh, because you have the evil position, you are evil, whereas high stager are going to be more, hmm, um, I, I will let you have any position as long as we can uh, keep keep the game that, that uh, going, that, that, that uh, uh, retains meaningful, meaningful communication, meaningful, productive communicative action, let's say, right? So, so that's, it's also what you see in, in the sociology, by the way, Habermas, the great sociologist of the 20th century of the later 20th century, was all about exactly this process, right? Uh, there's something beyond the position itself. There is something about the structure of discourse that uh, can take different forms. And we have, and if you want to improve society, really, you have to improve uh, that, uh, the quality of that discourse. And that means strong norms. Um, so you compromise your position or you bracket your your ideas, but you, while you're bracketing the ideas, you don't bracket, you don't compromise on what's okay to do and not, right? All right. Um, thank you, Daniel. Uh, and we'll sneak uh, one question in, and then uh, someone's going to have a post-session after this. They're going to drop a link in the chat. Uh, but Benita Roy, you have a question. Hi, Daniel. I didn't mean to write over your slides. I tr I didn't understand why my cursor and the cursor on the screen were, I'm like, are they moving together? And then I couldn't erase it. I couldn't pick up the yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> No, no, because I felt bad after you had the nice slides. And graffiti, graffiti bonita. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what, what did you want to ask? <laughs> okay. So something I've been working with a long time, and I think you're someone who could really put some good thought to it, is that 
for me, it, there's developmental logics, and that's where one stage builds on the prior stage. Now, I know there's a leap and there's just continuity and stuff like that. But for me, there's evolutionary dynamics, which means the next highest stage over the long term doesn't necessarily build on the prior highest stage. So when the dinosaurs went extinct, the shrews, which were certainly not the apex species, became our progenitors. And when the fabulous fishes of the Cambrian explosion came, they all died out and the worms became the ancestors for the men. Okay. And this, I think, is something that developmental stage theorists are allergic to. This is a very strong reality in long-term evolution. And I think that there needs to be a distinction between developmental and evolutionary change dynamics. They're not the same. And I think developmental stage theorists tend to put developmental stage, developmental change dynamics into evolutionary dynamics. Now, the question is, do cultures develop or evolve? And I think this is an extremely important conversation that um, could, could I'd love to have with you or, or just have you work on it. <laughs> Um, but I, I, you know, I don't, it's not a critique per se. It's like we need to expand it into, like I accuse Wilbur of only having a development, you know, it's monological in terms of developmental dynamics, and he conflates evolutionary ones with that. So I think, and so I think even developmental stage shares can say, oh, but we have to be careful because we don't know what stage will eventually leap ahead. It's not necessarily, to me, I think, in, 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 we can't count on, and in fact, the case could be made, like I think you kind of said it, you know, like the little digerati, Western digerati, is not necessarily primed to be fit for civilization collapse. It's probably um, young, uh, you know, young women in Africa who know how to invent things or something. So I think this is an interesting conversation. Maybe you could just riff off of it or something. But yeah, I mean, yeah, no, no real comment. I, I, I agree with you, Benita. It's like, if if we, for instance, have, if if we uh, if if we throw out the more staircase drawing and we have the three tree branch drawing, drawing, and we then see that the that the oldest tree branch is the biggest one uh, that can branch off most actually and has the greatest variety and and uh, and um, and age and specialization uh, then then. I mean, what you're saying just makes a lot more sense. You see the whole tree at the same time, right? It's easy to just, well, you know, get this tunnel vision, uh, which, you know, did happen, unfortunately, around integral community. And uh, yeah, I mean, I, I felt that way too, I guess. And when I found out about the stuff and, you know, like, wow, and then something huge is going to happen over here. And it's like, nah, it doesn't exactly work that way. And yeah. Mm. So, so, so I agree. Uh, that being said, I, I... I still think there's, uh, I mean, there's a special role for, for all these for wider, wider community. Um, yeah, especially as you said, in the individual and sociocultural context. You know, it's about what time frame are you are you looking in? But anyways, yeah, thank you for for taking my comment. All right, thanks, Benita. Um, Daniel, you're 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 freeze you're froze a little bit there, um, but we'll uh, come to a close now. Uh, any parting words you'd like to leave us uh, with, Daniel, at the stoa? I mean, I, I had plenty of uh, plenty of opportunity to to sort of give my my last fiery speech there, but um, uh, but I mean the the takeaway is like, okay, guys, be patient with this stuff. Um, you know, we're I mean, the, the stage theories aren't going to be toppled as some critics think. They're going to be uh, complexified and and contextualized further um and and they're going to be it become part of more and more of of, of larger actually uh, uh theorizing projects that are yet more inclusive and and context uh sensitive 
Um, and yes, there are real risks with stage theories, and yes, they have been misused so many times. So it's, I mean, if, if we see, if we lift the gaze to the bigger yin yang thing, uh, we see that it's a good thing that we're having, that we're having these discussions, and that we should expect to be keeping having them. And that in and of itself is a sort of seed for, for the most productive stuff on this on this edge, right? So that's that's the main that's my that's the sentiment I would like to share with all of you. Awesome. Well, uh, let's give uh, Daniel a round of applause. Thank you so much, Daniel, for coming to the Stoa today, uh, presenting um, the case for metamodernism. I'm sure uh, Dave might have a comment or two after after this goes up. Um, and at the Stoa, we have a pack week today. Um, so on. Uh, Wednesday, I believe, uh, June 14th, we have a session on dark wellness. Raven Connolly, uh, Owen Cox, and Alex Eber are going to talk about this concept, dark wellness. Patrick Ryan, the most dangerous man on the internet, is going to return, um, uh, have a session on applied psychosecurity. And uh, the final evolving ground uh, episode, uh, Charlie and Jared are going to come back with Dave Chapman uh, from Meaningness. So he's the first time David's going to come to uh, the store, which is super cool. So you can check out that all on the stoa.ca. Um, so that being said, Daniel, everyone, thank you so much for coming to the stoa today.